Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Having discussed the first part of the Matthew effect in science, when we discussed uh, the reward and the communication systems proposed by Merton, okay. now we will discuss the second part of the Matthew effect in science in the form of cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property. Okay. Now, when we discuss these two aspects against the backdrop of Matthew effect in science, namely cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property, I mean cumulative advantage on the one hand and intellectual property on the other, then what do these two terms reflect? Okay. Cumulative advantage in science refers to the social processes through which various kinds of opportunities for scientific inquiry as well as the subsequent symbolic and material rewards for the results of that inquiry tend to accumulate for individual practitioners of science as they do also for organizations engaged in scientific work. In here, Merton tried to look at individual practitioners of science, okay. then he will move on to scientific community as such, then he will move on to the, the accumulation of scientific knowledge uh, by the young professionals, I mean junior scientists, students okay. and then he will get on get into uh, accumulation of scientific knowledge by research organizations, research institutions. Okay. In this sense, we are trying to look at cumulative advantage in science, which refers it, it is applied in the domain of science itself, which refers to the social processes through which various kinds of opportunities for scientific inquiry as well as the subsequent symbolic and material rewards for the results of that inquiry tend to accumulate for individual practitioners of science, I mean scientists themselves as they do also for organizations engaged in scientific work. Such cumulative uh, uh, advantage in science directs our attention to the ways in which initial comparative advantages of trained capacity, structural location and available resources make for successive increments of advantage such that the gaps between the haves on the one hand and the have nots on the other in science as, as is envisaged in other domains of social life which widen until dampened by countervailing forces, which what are countervailing forces? We will discuss a little while later. Okay. But the way cumulative advantage in science is discussed here by Merton, okay, it directs our attention to the ways in which initial comparative advantages of one trend capacity, two structural location, three available resources which make for successive increments of advantage such that the gaps between the haves and the have nots in science as we find the similar trends in other domains of social life which get widened until dampened by countervailing processes. This is the first part that you, you will find that cumulative advantage in science. Then what is this intellectual property in science? Martin proposed the seeming paradox that in science 
private property is established by having its substance freely given to others who might want to make use of it. You have, we have already discussed the ethos of science by Merton, where we discussed four ethos of modern science namely universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. Okay? Communism is very integral to the debates on intellectual property in science. What did we discuss in communism? That the, the product or the process must be owned by the scientific community, must be owned by, uh, I mean it must be owned by the scientific community in such a way that it will have a greater accessibility for the public. Okay? Now, due to intellectual property in science, the concept of private property is imposed on the fruits of such technological development born out of science. Okay? Now, Martin proposed that, proposed a seeming paradox that in science, private property, the notion of intellectual property, the, the, the notion of private property in a more capitalistic sense is established by having its substance freely given to others who might want to make use of it. Okay? In such a scenario, what we generally find that certain institutionalized aspects of this property system chiefly in the form of public acknowledgement of the source of knowledge and information thus freely bestowed on fellow scientists relate to the social one and second cognitive structures of science in interesting ways that affect the collective advancement of scientific knowledge. When I say, when we say social structure of science and when we say cognitive structure of science, they should not be examined in isolation and any attempt to study them uh, in isolation uh, as, uh, will, will be misleading. Okay? social and cognitive, they are interrelated. Okay? Cognition means uh, ways to know. Okay? Now, the cognitive structure of science must be socially, politically, economically, culturally, institutionally, ideologically, legally, ethically embedded. Okay? Now, if, if, if in intellectual property in science, such institutionalized aspects of such property system in a more capitalistic sense, chiefly in the form of public acknowledgement of the source of knowledge and information, okay, which is uh, freely bestowed on fellow scientists relate to these two structures of science namely social on the one hand and cognitive on the other in interesting ways that affect the collective advancement of scientific knowledge. Okay. Now, in this, in this lecture, what we are going to do? We are going to uh, look at the Matthew effect in, in, in its generality. Okay? I mean the Matthew effect in science in its generality. Okay? The accumulation of advantage and disadvantage for scientists, accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young scientists in particular, then accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among scientific institutions, research organizations, research institutions, then followed by countervailing forces and the symbolism of intellectual property in science. Okay? Now, let us see how the Matthew effect in science in its generality may be discussed. Okay? Let us begin by noting a theme. Okay? Uh, let us begin by noting a theme that runs through Harriet Jackerman's hours long interviews with Nobel laureates in the early 1960s. As we have already discussed, Harriet Jackerman was a collaborator of uh, Robert Martin. Martin banked on Jackerman's interviews with Nobel laureates uh, to, to locate, to to posit inequalities in science. Okay? And it is repeatedly suggested 
in in those interviews conducted by Harriet Jackerman, okay, uh, that eminent scientists get disproportionately credit great credit for their contributions to science, while relatively unknown ones unknown scientists relatively less known scientists tend to get disproportionately little for their occasionally comparable contributions. Okay. Let us let us put it this way if I if I can do this that uh, that that for example, a prize will almost always be uh, awarded to the most senior researcher involved in a project even if all the work has been uh, was done by a graduate student or a junior scientist. Okay. If we if you look at the slide here that the, the world of science is just like a pyramid structure or a triangle, where at the lower level you will find more and more scientists with a very few rewards and recognitions. The world of science has been structured in such a way that at the top there will be a very few scientists with more rewards and recognitions, even if those even if all the work has been done by lesser known scientists or graduate students. Okay. Such, such unequal structure that, we, that you see on the slide that the world of science has created, I mean the, the world of science has been structured in, a, in such a way that it has posed, it has created such inequalities. Okay. In this context, it is important to note from, from Jackerman's interviews with Nobel laureates that how eminent scientists get disproportionately great credit for their contributions to science, while relatively unknown scientists, relatively lesser known uh, practitioners of science tend to get disproportionately little for their occasionally comparable contributions. Okay. This is very important. Buttressing the argument, strengthening the argument further, one, one Nobel, Nobel laureate told uh, Harriet Jackerman once in the process of such interviews that the world is peculiar in this matter of how it gives credit. It is a peculiarity. Okay. The world is peculiar including the world of science is peculiar in this matter of how it gives credit. It tends to give the credit to already famous people, to already known people. Okay. This is very important. The claim, the claim that prime recognition for scientific work by informed peers and not merely by the uh, inevitably uninformed lay public is skewed in favor of established scientists requires indeed that the nature and quality of these diversely apprised contributions be identical or at least much the same. That condition such condition is approximated in cases of full collaboration and in cases of independent multiple discoveries. That is why Martin was giving the example of um, Newton and Leibniz earlier we have already discussed. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, history of science in I mean history of physics, history of mathematics, okay, you will find the kind of controversies which uh, um, arose in the context of the works of Newton as well as Leibniz. Okay. Such, such condition is approximated in cases of full collaboration and in cases of independent multiple discoveries. At least now independent multiple discoveries have been attributed to the controversies of controversies between uh, uh, Newton and Leibniz. Okay. It is very important. Such inequality persists in the world of science itself as we have discussed in this slide. Okay. The distinctive contributions of collaborators 
are often difficult to disentangle uh, to disentangle independent multiple discoveries if not identical or at least enough alike to be defined as functional equivalents by the uh, uh, principles involved I mean principal investigators involved or by their informed peer groups. Such in it is it is designed in such a manner that the whole lot of relatively lesser known uh, scientists practitioners of science will be left out of the of the of the way the world of science has been structured. Okay. It is it is important to know uh, to it is important to understand such misallocation uh, of uh, of recognition that uh, that how uh, uh, a very few scientists get all accolades okay even if much of the work has been carried out by the junior scientists or graduate students phd students okay a nobel laureate in physics told uh, Jackerman that the man who is best known gets more credit and inordinate amount of credit. A Nobel laureate in chemistry puts it this way that let me quote here if my name is if my name was on a paper people would remember it not remember who else uh, was involved. The biological scientists uh, like R. C. Uh, Leontine and uh, J. L. Hubby have lately reported a similar pattern of experience with a pair of their collaborative papers. Okay, I mean in terms of citation classics. Okay, I mean even if other, uh, even if less significant, less prominent authors have contributed to the designing of a paper, if less uh, uh, to the making of that paper the more well known scientists get the yeah, get uh, all the accolades. The, the, the way uh, Leontine and Hubby described the matter of the, the Matthew effect, I mean not the way Martin tried to do that, tried to theorize upon it, okay. they also tried to reflect on this aspect of inequalities in science in terms of their own Lebenswelt. Lebenswelt, I mean, it is, uh, uh, I mean, life world. Okay. It's a uh, French-German word. Okay. Let in Latin also people use Lebenswelt. Uh, it it means uh, uh, life world. Those Nobel laureates, namely uh, Leontine and uh, Hubby, they they were trying to say that one paper was cited some 310 times, the other some 300, 525 times. The first paper described a method and the second let me quote here, it is very interesting. If the first paper described a method, the second paper gave the detailed result of the application of the method to natural populations. The two papers were a genuinely collaborative effort in conception, execution and writing and clearly formed an invisible pair, published back to back in the same issue of the journal. The order of authors was alternated with the biochemist Habi being the senior author in the method paper and the population geneticist Leontine as senior author in the application. Okay. Yet, paper 2 has been cited over 50 percent more than more frequently than paper 1. I mean the application paper has been cited more frequently than the methodological paper. Okay. Then citations to paper 1 as, as uh, both laureates, both Nobel laureates namely Leontine and Hubby, they uh, put it that citations to the method methodological paper virtually never stand alone, but are nearly always paired with a citation to the, the application paper, the paper with application, but the reverse is not true. 
wherever the, the paper with application has been cited, it is not necessary that the, the methodological paper also has been cited. Why? I mean, what is the reason of this? We seem to have, uh, have a clear cut case of Merton's Matthew effect. That is what they were trying to see, both Nobel laureates. They were trying to look at Mertonian inequalities in science, Mertonian Matthew effect in science in terms of rewards, in terms of recognitions, in terms of cumulative advantage in science and in terms of symbolism of intellectual property in science. Okay? That the already better known investigator in a field gets the credit for joint work irrespective of the order of authors on the paper and so gets even better known by an, uh, by an uh, autocatalytic process. In 1966, Leontine had been a professional for a dozen years and was well known among the population geneticists to whom the paper was addressed while, while Hubby's career had been much shorter and was known chiefly to biochemical geneticists. Okay? As a result, the population geneticists have consistently regarded uh, uh, Leontine as the senior member of the team and given him undue credit for what was a completely collaborative work that would have been impossible for either one of us alone. That is what this suggests, both of them. At the extreme, at the extreme if you look at this, okay, at the extreme such misallocation of credit can occur even when a published paper bears only the name of a hitherto unknown and uncredentialed scientist. Consider, let, let us consider this observation by the invincible geneticist and biochemist, we all know him, uh, I mean STS scholars also know him as a top, top class historian of science, uh, J. B. S. Haldane, whose not having received a Nobel Prize can be cited as prime evidence of the fallibility of the judges in, in, the, uh, in the Swedish Academy of Sciences. I mean, uh, in Stockholm they decide Nobel, Nobel Prize and uh, we all know what kind of problems it can uh, pose. Speaking with uh, 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 Ronald Clark uh, of S. K. Roy, uh, uh, his, uh, I mean his talented Indian student, student from India. Uh, who had conducted important experiments designated to improve strains of rice, Halden observed that. J. B. S. Halden, I said uh, he was an, he was a great uh, geneticist and biochemist, uh, eminent historian of science as well. Okay. He observed, Halden observed that Roy himself deserved, I mean that student from India, he himself deserved 95 percent of the credit. The other 5 percent may be divided between the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata and myself. Myself means Halden himself, he added. Halden deserves credit for letting him try what he thought was a rather ill-planned experiment on the general principle that, that Halden himself is not omniscient. But Halden had little hope that credit would be given that way. Every effort will be made here to crab his work he wrote. He has got, he has not got a PhD uh, or even a first class MSc, I mean Roy. Okay? So, either the research is good or I did it. I mean Halden mentioned this. Okay? Now, if you look at this, such, such misallocation of rewards, misallocation of recognitions that we have, uh, we have seen in this, in this slide in the world of science. Uh, I mean, where more scientists are endowed with a very few rewards and recognitions and a very few scientists with more rewards and uh, uh, recognitions, accolades. What do we find? That, that it is such patterns of misallocation of recognition for scientific work that Merton described as the Matthew effect. The not quite foreordained term derives of course, from the first book of the New Testament, the gospel according to uh, Matthew. In the stately prose of the uh, King uh, James Version, created by what must be one of the most scrupulous and inconsequential uh, teams of scholars in Western history, 
the well remembered passage reads for uh, for unto everyone that hath shall be given he shall have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has i mean this is a clear case of um, a clear case of the the distinction between the haves and the have nots okay now now from from such i mean uh, we, we must go beyond we must make a shift from such spiritual uh, account of uh, uh, inequality to to a more secular account of inequality okay and that, that's what martin also said that let's move on to uh, but we let's take this account okay let's take the let's use this term to make sense of the of the data which have been derived from jackerman's interview now the matthew effect is accruing of large increments of peer recognition of two scientists of great repute for particular contributions in contrast to the minimizing or withholding of such recognition for scientists who have not yet made their mark the biblical parable generates a corresponding sociological parable that is a i mean that's why we must make this this shift from a, a biblical account to a more sociological account or to a more secular account okay for this is for this is the form it seems that the distribution of psychic income and cognitive wealth in science also takes how this comes to be and with what consequences for the fate of individual practitioners of science and the advancement of scientific knowledge are the questions in hand okay now it is very important to understand such dynamic okay now what we have discussed till now in these 20 25 minutes that what we have discussed we have discussed the matthew effect in the context of cumulative advantage in science as well as the symbolism of intellectual property but we have not yet come to in detail at length and in detail cumulative advantage and intellectual property in science we will we'll come to this point okay partly we have covered cumulative advantage but we will we'll come to cumulative advantage in much detail now okay what we have discussed i mean cumulative advantage in science which refers to the social processes through which various kinds of opportunities for scientific inquiry as well as the subsequent symbolic and material rewards for the results of that inquiry tend to accumulate for individual scientists as they do also for organizations engaged in scientific work that's why individual is always a part of that institution okay further cumulative advantage in science directs our attention to the way in which initial competitive advantages of trained capacity structural location and available resources make for successful uh, successive increments of advantage such that the gaps between the haves and the have nots in science the the gaps between more well known scientists with with a very few Uh, uh, I mean, more well-known, uh, a very, uh, a very few uh, well-known scientists with more rewards and recognitions, on the one hand, and more scientists uh, uh, with no recognition. As the the gaps between the haves and the have-nots in science widen until dampened by countervailing processes. What are the countervailing processes? We'll discuss. Okay. Further, intellectual property in science, as Martin proposed. that the seeming paradox that in science private property is established by having its substance freely given to, given to others who might want to make use of it and certain institutionalized aspects of this property system chiefly in the form of public acknowledgement of the source of knowledge and information thus freely bestowed on fellow scientists relate to the social and cognitive structures of science in interesting ways that affect the collective advancement of scientific knowledge thus the social and the cognitive structures of science should not be treated in isolation then we we discussed the matthew effect uh, the matthew effect in science in its generality okay how eminent scientists get disproportionately great credit for their contributions to science 
while relatively unknown scientists tend to get disproportionately little or nothing for their occasionally comparable contributions. This is how uh, uh, for example, uh, we discussed a prize will almost always be rewarded to the most senior researcher involved in a project even if all the work was done by a graduate student or a junior scientist. That is this is how we try to look at the world of science, this is how we look at uh, the ways in which the world of science has been structured and where you will find mm, the world of science is structured in such a way that, that it poses. Uh, uh, I mean it, it has a, it has an in internal structure that uh, which is externally conditioned that that uh, 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 where you will find more scientists with a few rewards and recognitions and a very few scientists with more rewards and recognitions at the top level. That is why uh, uh, we have put it this way that more scientists with a few rewards and recognitions at the bottom level. At the bottom you will find many scientists with little recognition but at the top you will find a very few scientists with more rewards and recognitions. Okay? That is why in the words of a laureate, Nobel laureate as Jackerman puts it that uh, the world is peculiar in this matter of how it gives credit. It tends to give the credit to already famous people, to already well known people. Okay? Then we discussed how the claim that prime recognition for scientific work by informed peers and not merely by the inevitably uninformed lay public is skewed in favor of established scientists requires of course, that the nature and quality of these diversely apprised contributions be identical or at least much the same. And such condition is approximated in the cases of full collaboration or in the cases of independent multiple discoveries that we have already discussed in the context of the controversies between Newton and Leibniz and such distinctive contributions to collaborator of collaborators are often difficult to disentangle independent multiple discoveries if not identical or at least enough alike to be defined as functional equivalents by the principles, principal investigators involved or by their informed peer, peer groups. And it is such patterns of the misallocation of recognition, where your work remains or your work goes unrecognized uh, for the scientific work that Merton described as the Matthew effect. The not quite foreordained term derives of course, from the first book of the New Testament, the gospel according to Matthew. This is a spiritual account, uh, I mean this is not uh, what we are doing here, it is we are trying to make a shift from we are taking the the taking the turn from uh, uh, from such biblical account, but we are trying to make a shift from such uh, such uh, spiritual account uh, of inequalities of uh, in science to a more secular account of inequalities in science. In the stately prose of the King James version, created by what must be one of the most scrupulous and uh, consequential teams of scholars in western history the well remembered passage reads for unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him uh, that hath not shall be taken away even that which he, he hath i mean for unto every one that has shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that has not shall be taken away even if that which he hath I mean hath in this sense, I mean in English it is hadge. Okay? Uh, I mean this is also English, but uh, uh, the earlier usage of English was hath, I mean in the bibli biblical account. Okay? And the Matthew effect is the accruing of large increments of peer recognition to scientists of great repute for particular contributions in contrast to the minimizing or withholding of such recognition for scientists who have not yet made their mark. The biblical parable generates a corresponding sociological parable that is what I said I mean uh, uh, we must make a shift from such biblical or spiritual account to a more uh, sociological account to a more scientific account to uh, or to a more secular account. Okay? To, to posit such 
inequality in science for this is the form it seems that the distribution of psychic income and cognitive wealth of science also takes place. How this comes to be and with what consequences for the fate of individual scientists and the advancement of scientific knowledge are the questions in hand from here onward we will move on to the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage for scientists then we will move on to the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young scientists, junior scientists, graduate students, PhD students then we will move on to accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among scientific institutions, research organizations, research institutions and so on followed by countervailing processes and the symbolism of intellectual property in science. Okay? Now, let us start with the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage for scientists. Take, taken out of its spiritual context okay, and placed in a wholly secular context, the Matthew doctrine, the Matthew effect would seem to hold that the posited process must result in a boundlessly growing inequality of wealth. However, wealth is construed in any sphere of human activity. Conceived of as a locally ongoing process and not as a single event, the practice of giving on to everyone that has much while taking from everyone that has little will lead to the rich getting forever richer while the poor become poorer. Increasingly absolute and not only relative deprivation would be the continuing order of the day, but as we know things are not as simple as all that. After all, the extrapolation of local exponentials is notoriously misleading. In, in noting this, Merton did not intend uh, uh, to uh, assess the current economic theory of the distribution of wealth and income. Um, instead, he reported, instead Merton reported what a focus upon uh, the skewed distribution of peer recognition and research productivity in science has led some of us to identify as the processes and consequences of the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage in science. Okay? I mean for the I mean when, when Merton tried to look at such, uh, 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 such uh, I mean when Merton first stumbled upon the general question of social stratification in science in the early 1940s, one paper of that period alludes to the accumulation of differential advantages for certain segments of the population differentials that are not necessarily bound up with demonstrated differences in capacity. It would not be correct or indeed just to say that the text is no clearer to anybody now than the notoriously obscure um, uh, anything was clear to somebody else. Okay? Um, that is why um, for such for such things uh, the notion of cumulative advantage in science had led only to a ghostly existence in uh, private musings sporadically conjured up for oral publication rather than put in print. Further investigation of the process of cumulative advantage took hold in the later 1960s with the formation of a research quartet of at Columbia uh, consisting of Harriet Jackerman, uh, Stephen Cole, Jonathan R. Cole and Robert King Martin. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, this, this galaxy of uh, uh, thinkers, okay, uh, uh, you will find uh, their works not only in, in humanities and social sciences, but also in sciences, engineering. Okay. They had enormous impact, uh, their writings had enormous impact on, uh, on the world of sciences as well as the world of humanities and social sciences. There has since emerged an invisible college as Merton put it. Uh, in fact, the invisible college I mean uh, that was coined by Derek D. J. Sola Price. Okay? What is that? What does that refer to? Okay? That is to adapt the brilliant uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, terminological uh, reconage by Sola Price which has grown apace in contributing to a program of research on cumulative advantage and disadvantage in social stratification generally and in science specifically. Okay? See, uh, one must remember 
the difference between stratification hierarchy and so on, but this is not uh, a course in introduction to sociology which uh, I had earlier uh, offered in uh, uh, under NPTEL, okay. but still one must uh, remember the vertical and horizontal aspects of both stratification as well as hierarchy. If you want you can look at the lecture notes of NPTEL, uh, I mean lecture notes of introduction to sociology which I developed under NPTEL phase 2. Okay. Notably including Derek D. J. Sola Price himself until I mean uh, till his de sad demise that college uh, uh, also numbers uh, I mean uh, Allison, Barber, Blau uh, and others uh, there are so many. Okay. This surely when, when we discuss solar prices invisible college in the context of such social stratification in science, okay, uh, differentiation in science, differential treatment uh, in the world of science to its own practitioners. Okay. This is not the occasion for providing a synopsis of, of that now, con, uh, now, now considerable body of research materials. Rather, what Merton did, Merton only reminded um, uh, us of a few of the marked inequalities and strongly skewed distributions of productivity and resources in science and then focus on the consequences of the bias focused on the consequences of such bias prejudice in favor of uh, 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 precocity uh, that is built into our institutions for detecting and rewarding talent um, and institutionalized bias that may help bring about severe inequalities um, uh, during the life course of scholars uh, uh, including scientists. Okay. Then let us first have a quick sampling of the abundance of uh, conspicuously skewed uh, distributions and inequalities uh, identifiable at a given time. Okay. Then Merton tried to provide certain examples to look at how, how uh, such sampling of the abundance of uh, uh, conspicuously skewed distributions and inequalities okay, within science. The total number of scientific papers published by scientists differs enormously ranging from the large proportion of PhDs who publish one paper or none at all to the rare likes of uh, many uh, scholars who have produced many papers from their PhD thesis okay, uh, like uh, William Thompson, Kelvin with his 600 plus papers or the mathematician uh, Kelly publishing a paper every few weeks throughout his work life for a total of almost a thousand. Okay. Secondly, the skewed distribution of the sheer number of published papers is best approximated by variants of uh, Lotka's, Alfred J. Lotka's inverse square law of scientific productivity, which states that the number of scientists with n publications is, pro is proportional to n square. Okay. Uh, in a variety of disciplines, this works out to some 5 to 6 percent of the scientists who publish at all uh, uh, at all producing about half of all papers in their disciplines. Okay. Uh, even when I talk to uh, my PhD students, uh, I always uh, I very often tell them not always, but I very often tell them that uh, you publish or perish. Okay. But when you look at publications, when you look at publications over a period of time, okay, uh, I always uh, feel that uh, instead of publishing perishable items, one must refrain from publishing. This is very important. We will we'll discuss these things, uh, I mean the, these items or uh, these notions always hover our, I mean these notions always propel us to think beyond the world of publications. Okay. It does not imply that one should not publish, one must publish, but instead of publishing perishable items, okay, one must refrain from, from publishing, one must publish something which is novel, one must publish something which has not been touched upon by others, one must 
build on those existing materials to come up with something new. That newness may be very rude, may be at a very rudimentary stage, may be at a very elementary stage, but one must be able to publish new things. Okay? That is how we tend to look at uh, the tradition of cumulative knowledge products. Okay? The distributions, the, the distributions in publications are even more skewed in the use of scientists works by their peer groups as that use is cr uh, crudely indexed by the number of citations to it. Much the same distribution has been found in various data sets. Typical is Goffield's um, uh, finding that for an aggregate of some 19 million articles published in the physical and biological sciences between 1961 and 0.3 percent were cited more than 100 times, another 2.7 percent between 25 and 100 times and at the other extreme some 58 percent of those papers articles that were cited at all were cited only once in that 20, 20 year period. This inequality you will recognize uh, is steeper than Pareto like distributions of income, Wilfredo Pareto if somebody is very interested to look at that, uh, one can look at Wilfredo, uh, Wilfredo Pareto's uh, economic theory of distribution, distribution of income. Okay? When it comes to, but this is not a part of our exercise, but I am just trying to give you certain examples where somebody can, uh, can go very interdisciplinary as STS itself is interdisciplinary. That is why I said uh, from the very beginning, I said STS is such such an interdisciplinary uh, exciting enterprise that uh, you will find that it is a conglomeration of philosophy of science, uh, history of science and sociology of science. Now, now many, many uh, aspects, many fields of inquiry, they also contribute to the, uh, uh, to the development of STS. Uh, for example, literature, okay. it is very important, linguistics, very important, okay. uh, we, we must anthropology, psychology, okay. they are very important. When it comes to changes in the extent of inequalities of research productivity and recognition during the course of an individual's work life as a scientist, the needed longitudinal data are much more scarce. Again, a few suggestive findings uh, which, which Merton uh, has provided are like this. I mean, in their simulation of longitudinal data through disaggregation of a cross section of some 2000 American biologists, mathematicians, chemists and physicists, physicists into several strata by carrier age, Paul D. Allison and John A. Stewart found that a clear and substantial rise in inequality for both the number of research publications in the preceding five years and the number of citations to previously researched work from the younger to the older strata strongly supporting the accumulative advantage hypothesis. Allison and Stewart secondly also confirmed the Jackerman Merton hypothesis that decreasing research productivity with increasing res age results largely from differing rates of attrition in research roles and that this approximates an all or none phenomenon. The hypothesis held that the more productive scientists recognized uh, as such by the reward system in science, reward system of science tend to persist in their research roles while those with declining research productivity tend to shift to other indispensable roles in science, not excluding the conventionally maligned role of research administrator. Derek D. J. Solaprice pointedly reformulated and developed that hypothesis, that hypothesis of Jackerman and Merton. Okay? That uh, what, what was that hypothesis? That, that decreasing res research productivity with increasing age. Okay. That because there is a very large but decreasing chance that any given researcher will discontinue publication. The group of workers that reaches the research front 
during a particular year will decline steadily in total output as time goes on. Gradually one after another they will drop away from the research front. Thus, the yearly output of the group as a whole will decline and now comes the essential point Jackerman and Merton tried to emphasize. Even though any given individual within it may produce at a steady rate throughout her or his entire professional lifetime. That is why it is important to distinguish the this effect of mortality at the research front from any differences in the actual rates of productivity at different ages among those that remain at the front. It is very important. With regard to the Matthew effect and associated cumulative advantage in science, what Stephen Cole found in an ingeniously designed study of a sample of American physicists that the greater their author scientific reputation, the more likely that papers of roughly equal quality as assessed by the later number of citations to them will receive rapid peer recognition by citation within a year after publication. Okay. Prior repute of authors somewhat advances the speed of diff diffusion of their contributions. Stephen Cole further found that it is a distinct advantage for physicists of still small uh, reputation or little reputation to be located in the departments uh, most highly rated uh, by peer groups that their new work diffuses more rapidly through that through the science networks than comparable work by their counterparts in peripheral university departments. Then we will discuss accumulation of advantage and disadvantage okay, among the young scientists, among the junior scientists, among the graduate students, among the PhD research scholars. Okay. It is very important to understand this. Then what we have discussed till now? We have discussed the Matthew effect in its generality in terms of cumulative advantage and we will discuss later on the symbolism of intellectual property. Then we, we have discussed I mean cumulative advantage in science which refers to the social processes through which various kinds of opportunities for scientific inquiry as well as the subsequent symbolic and material rewards for the results of that inquiry tend to accumulate for individual practitioners of science, I mean scientists themselves as they do also for organizations engaged in scientific work. Cumulative advantage in science directs our attention to the ways in which initial comparative advantages of three things, trend capacity, structural location and available resources make for successive increments of advantage such that the gaps between the haves and the have nots widen until dampened by uh, countervailing force processes. Those countervailing processes will be discussed a little while later and such gaps between the haves and have nots are not only found in the world of uh, science, but also are found in the domains of in other domains of social life. Then intellectual property in science we have discussed how certain institutional aspects of this property system chiefly in the form of public acknowledgement of the source of knowledge and information okay, thus freely bestowed on fellow scientists relate to the social and cognitive structures of science. We have discussed the Matthew effects in its generality we have discussed the world of science the way it is structured we have discussed. We have also discussed how the, the world of science is peculiar in a matter of how it gives credit. It gives it tends to give the credit to already famous people and then we have discussed the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage for scientists. In the lectures to follow we are going to discuss the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young scientists, the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among research organizations, scientific institutions, uh, research institutions and so on. Then followed by countervailing processes and the symbolism of intellectual property in science. Thank you.